In his Habilitationsschrift, the second thesis in the German academic system, which appeared in 1933, Theodor W. Adorno critically investigates Søren Kierkegaard's philosophy, only one of many philosophies young Adorno targeted. Adorno's critique of Kierkegaard's existential philosophy must be seen in connection with his critique of Edmund Husserl's phenomenology and of Martin Heidegger's fundamental ontology. Adorno thought that all of these philosophies were expressions of bourgeois subjectivity which did not do what they promised, namely to overcome the idealist philosophies of Kant and Hegel. In addition, for Adorno, empirical social research with which he will be later confronted in the United States was an expression of reification because social researchers developed a methodology deduced from the natural sciences that was detached from the objects they investigated, the social phenomena. In Adorno's eyes, existential philosophy, phenomenology and quantitative social research were in league with the devil of positivism. Exactly 33 years later, in 1966, Adorno published his Fat Child, as he used to call his main philosophical work, The Negative Dialectics. The publication of this book was motivated by Adorno's conviction that contemporary philosophy proved to be unable to honor the promise of being at one with reality and therefore philosophy was obliged, in his mind, to criticize itself uncompromisingly. Indeed, the negative dialectics was the most radical critique of contemporary philosophy in the late 1960s. According to Adorno, I quote, the presence of identity was formally inherent in every kind of thinking. Thinking means identifying, end of quote. That what thinking wanted to investigate Adorno claimed to become veiled by an abstract order of categorizing and classifying. To unveil this false philosophical consciousness, dialectics was the remedy, I quote, dialectics is the consequent consciousness of non-identity, end of quote. Only dialectics could show this wrong consciousness, its inherent contradictories, and only through dialectics experience philosophical categorization and the intrinsic material value of phenomena could be reconciled. Still, as in 1933, Adorno identified Heidegger's fundamental ontology as predominantly being responsible for the reification of philosophical thinking, a style of thinking that in his eyes belonged to the same corrupted epistemologies as Wilfredo Pareto's and Karl Mannheim's sociology of knowledge, logical empiricism, critical rationalism, and quantitative social research, According to Adorno, all these philosophies and sociologies originated in the capitalist desire for dominating nature, and because they did not reflect this fact, they became backers of totalitarianism, which in his view rooted in capitalism. Only dialectics could unveil the truth, which he considered to be objective and not relative. It seems that from 1933 to 19. 66, Adorno radicalized his critique of modern Western thought. Adorno, a non-conformist who not just followed an established philosophical school, but created his own philosophy by combining Hegel's dialectics with Marx's historical materialism, and Freud's strife theory turned ever more uncompromising the older he got. What I want to do in my lecture is to follow Adorno's intellectual trajectory throughout the 33 years between his book on Kierkegaard and the negative dialectics, using Pierre Bourdieu's idea of habitus in order to carve out Adorno's intellectual radicalism. According to Bourdieu, habitus is the expression of a person's lifestyle. It is the material and behavioral manifestation of transcending individual and collective forms of practice. Habitus therefore encompasses mental and political attitudes, as well as scholarly thinking. It is a product of the past that determines agency and intellectual attitudes in the present. But habitus is not a rigid social condition completely determined by an individual socialization. It adapts to time and space. It actualizes and restructures itself throughout the specific 
trajectory of an, of an individual's life. My argument is that the driving force that radicalized Adorno's thinking was Auschwitz, which he witnessed while being in exile in the United States. Auschwitz appeared to him as crystallization of the dark side of modernity, where capitalism, fascism, and communism coalesced. For Adorno, Auschwitz was not only the symbol of, of the age of totalitarianism, but represented the fundamentally wrong development of modern man per se. Thus, Auschwitz became more for him than a historical occurrence. It turned to be the metaphysical core of Adorno's negative philosophical attitude towards modernity. You want to read the first slide? Oh, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> Born in 1903, Theodor W. Adorno grew up in Frankfurt am Main as the only son of a musician and a Jewish petit bourgeois wine merchant who had converted to Protestantism. This milieu, according to Bourdieu, was decisive for Adorno's primary period of socialization and it was crucial for Adorno's habitus, disposing of much cultural capital but of little money. This distribution of sorts of capital was constitutive for the trajectory Adorno pursued until very um, late in his life, when he got a full professorship in the, in the late 1950s, Adorno was financially dependent on patrons and friends, in particular on Max Horkheimer, who already, uh, but already early in his career, he developed a philosophy of an impressive radicalism. With barely, barely enough money to live and with, with much intellectual capacity, Adorno spent his youth in Frankfurt, where in 1921 he began studying philosophy, psychology, musicology, and sociology. He continued his studies in musicology in Vienna, where he worked with Alban Berg, a scholar of Arnold Schoenberg. In Frankfurt, he met Horkheimer, with whom Adorno shared his basic theoretical assumption. The friendship with Horkheimer was decisive for Adorno's emigration to the United States in 1938 after having studied at the University of Oxford from 1934 to 1938. Like Horkheimer, Adorno championed a left Hegelian dialectical philosophy enriched with Marx's critique of political economy and Freud's drive theory. In Bourdieu's words, Adorno, after having entered into the German academic field, chose to take up an orthodox and a heterodox trajectory at the same time. Orthodox was his trajectory in terms that he followed the ordinary German academic track, which included passing a dissertation and a habilitation. Unorthodox was his position because Adorno developed through his studies in philosophy, sociology, psychology and musicology, and through his friendship with Horkheimer, Siegfried Krakauer, Walter Benjamin, Ernst Bloch, and many other, other intellectuals who characterized what we today understand as Weimar culture, a radical critical state of mind. Leo Löwenthal, with whom Adorno entertained a problematic relationship, Benjamin, Bloch, Martin Buber, or Franz Rosenzweig, who either lived in Frankfurt or were closely connected with the intellectual culture of the city, wanted, according to Ensen Rabinbach, to form a modern Jewish consciousness, not fully assimilated to bourgeois culture, not Zionist, not traditionally religious, but also not completely secularized, a, I quote, modern Jewish messianism, radical, uncompromising, and comprised of an esoteric intellectualism that is as uncomfortable with the Enlightenment as it is enamored of an apocalyptic vision, whether revolutionary or purely redemptive in the spiritual sense." End of quote. The Weimar Kaleidoscope, as Stephen Ashheim calls it, was diverse and colorful, but uncompromising as attitude seems to be the most characteristic attribute for many thinkers of the Weimar era, whether they developed a doctrine of coldness, as philosophical anthropologist Helmut Plessner did, or a radical conservative worldview, as those young scholars who later formed the core staff of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt of the SS, Michael Wild called the members of this generation of young scholars in Weimar Republic, for good reason, 
an uncompromising generation. Adorno's philosophical attitude was radical, critical, and uncompromising. He was, in other words, a Weimar intellectual radical. I borrowed this term from a book by Timothy S. Brown entitled Weimar Radicals. The politically extreme forms of fascism and communism in mind, Brown defines Weimar radicalism as, I quote, a set of ideas and terms, socialism, nationalism, revolution, among others, that, whatever their differing balance from situation to situation, made a part of a discourse that extended across organizational boundaries and allowed radicals of differing stripes to talk to each other. End of quote. Referring to Helmut Plessner, Brown calls this a discourse of social radicalism, which, I quote, supplied the basis for a wide-ranging discussion about the nature of the ideal revolution and the ideal qualities of the revolutionary, end of quote. Brown's interpretation of Weimar policies and my adoption of this concept for analyzing Weimar radical intellectuals such as Adorno suits fine with Noah Strode's observation that the Weimar Republic was characterized by fierce debates between hostile groups of intellectuals and politicians. This uncompromising culture of debate during Weimar years becomes obvious in Adorno's hostile relationship to radical conservative intellectuals such as Heidegger. This culture was the outcome of a specific radical habitus. Adorno and Heidegger belonged to a generation of scholars situated between the front generation and the war youth generation, born in the late 19th and early centuries, early 20th centuries. For members of this generation, World War I meant a radical break with the world of their fathers, whose bourgeois values they considered mechanistic and empty. They developed new concepts and approaches for analyzing the world scientifically, in particular, they reconceptualized the relationship between Wissenschaft and Weltanschauung. For them, social scholarship and philosophical worldview coalesced into a lifestyle of seeing the world in uncompromising radical terms. Seen from this perspective, <clears throat> Weimar radical intellectual culture was a Deutsche Weltanschauungskultur, a German culture of Weltanschauung, as Per Leo would call it. Paul Foreman went so far to consider the development of quantum mechanics and its assertion of non-causality as results of the devastating defeat of Germany in World War I, provoked by anger, frustration and confusion about the inexplicable outcome of the war German intellectuals and scientists turned against determinism, rationality and causality. Whereas Adorno's dissertation on Husserl's phenomenology under the supervision of neo-Kantian philosopher Hans Cornelius followed the traditional philosophical style of thought in Germany, more or less, this, his habilitation thesis on Kierkegaard proved to be more avant-garde. The heterodox trajectory Adorno pursued became obvious at the occasion of his inaugural lecture at the University of Frankfurt after having passed his habilitation thesis. According to Adorno, as he wrote later to Siegfried Krakauer, the audience was shocked, upset, and angry about what Adorno had to say on the actuality of philosophy, as he called his lecture. I quote, With rage and anxiety, Wertheimer got a crying fit. Tillich, Adorno was his assistant at the Goethe University, found the form of the lecture offensive and improper because of its assertive tone, Mannheim railed against the lecture, and for Hochheimer it wasn't Marxist enough. You have no idea about the anger, the storm of hate, resistance, and nastiness of my lecture, my lecture provoked." End of quote. In his lecture, Adorno claimed that the great philosophical systems of German idealism, Kant and Hegel, lied in ruins, and that there was no possibility anymore to rebuild a philosophical coherent totality. Turning to Hegel upside down, Adorno assumed that social societal totality was the untrue whole. To, to approach this untrue whole and to work out its origins, contemporary philosophy needed in Adorno's opinion exact fantasy 
and the genealogical thinking in the tradition of Friedrich Nietzsche. The Frankfurt Institute of Social Research, directed by Horkheimer, left Germany in 1931-32. Its empirical sociological investigations of authoritarianism among German workers from 1930-31 brought evidence that fascism would establish in Germany and that the working class would be unable to resist national socialism. The institute was economically independent. It was financed by the Jewish merchant Hermann Weil and his son Felix, and therefore Horkheimer and his colleagues could establish branches, branch offices of the institute in Geneva, Paris, and London, although London only served as contemporary quarters in the case the situation in Switzerland and France would get worse. At this time, Adorno did not yet belong to the staff of Horkheimer's institute and was, therefore, not informed about its migration. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they immediately closed the Institute of Social Research, supported by professors of the University of Frankfurt, who compliantly offered the Nazi government their services. Categorized by the Nazis as half Jew, Adorno lost his venia, and the German police ransacked his apartment in the summer of 1933. However, his life was not immediately threatened, and Adorno still hoped that the Nazi regime was only a short-term horrific <coughs> episode in German history. <coughs> he retrospectively admitted that he, had, he, had, he failed to assess the situation in 1933 correctly, which was the reason why Adorno was so tentative and reluctant in preparing his immigration. Still, in 1934, he offered the Nazi regime his intellectual services, more precisely, Baldur von Schirach, for whose magazine of the Reich Youth Leadership, Adorno wrote a review in which he praised the new music of the Third Reich. In 1962-63, Klaus Christoph Schröder, a student at the University of Frankfurt, discovered this review and accused Adorno of having cooperated with the Nazis in an open letter that was published in a student magazine. Adorno replied to this accusation that explained his faux pas, I quote, I regret profoundly that I wrote this review back then. The real mistake was my wrong opinion about the situation, if you want, the foolery of someone who had the biggest difficulties to emigrate, end of quote. Adorno's intellectual habitus was deeply rooted in Weimar culture, and his speculative philosophy was so closely connected with the German language that he was even ready to accept the loss of his position as adjunct professor at the Goethe University, only to continue his life in Frankfurt. Borkheimer and his colleagues at the Institute were right in assuming that German fascism was not only a temporary plague. In contrast, the Nazi functionaries established themselves in Germany with the help of politicians and industrialists who willingly supported the Nazi regime in order to profit from it. After the Gestapo once again tried to search his apartment, Adorno finally realized the Nazis' grim will to establish their thousand-year Reich, and he emigrated to England as a consequence. Supported by the Academic Assistance Council, Adorno came to Merton College at Oxford University, where he started to work on his second dissertation in English. In the meantime, the group around Horkheimer started another empirical investigation, this time about the relationship between authoritarianism and family structure. They concluded that fascism would establish itself in whole Europe, which is the reason why they moved on to the United States supported by the president of New York's Columbia University, Nicholas Murray Butler, and the sociologists Robert Lind and Robert McIver, Horkheimer's Institute found a new home in New York in 1934. Feeling socially deprived, intellectually and linguistically foreign, Adorno started at this time to exchange letters with Horkheimer more intensively. Due to Adorno's special knowledge in musicology, Horkheimer found a possibility to bring Adorno to New York, Adorno would work half-time for Austrian Jewish social researcher Paul F. Lazarsfeld and half-time for the Institute of Social Research. When Adorno came to New York, he came as Weimar, radical, intellectual, as uncompromising as described above, 
unwilling to adapt his philosophy to quantitative methods of empirical social research and to pragmatism, two kinds of thinking and researching that were prominent in the intellectual and scientific field of contemporary, com contemporary United States. It is not surprising that Adorno's cooperation with Lars Asfeld was highly difficult. As musicologist and critic of contemporary popular music, Adorno's task was to engage in Lars Asfeld's Princeton radio research project. This proved to be highly difficult because Lars Asfeld, uh, Lars Asfeld's and Adorno's epistemologies differed profoundly from each other. Although Adorno showed great interest in this project, he was not willing or not able to adapt his kind of thinking to the style of research Lars Asfeld and his staff maintained. Lars Asfeld was an educated teacher of mathematics and physics who then had turned to social research advocating quantitative and deductive methods of empirical social research. Lars Asfeld deduced his, his types and categories from the empirical material and not from theoretical philosophical reflections. According to Lars Asfeld, Adorno's task was to operationalize modes of interpreting popular and classical music to build a system of hypotheses that could be controlled or tested by empirical investigation. <clears throat> With his radio project, Lars Asfeld intended to determine types of radio listeners through the analysis of their listening habits with the aim to make the listener quotas transparent. Although Lars Asfeld was not a generating facts, was for Adorno a dialectical process and not a deductive one. For Adorno, I quote, phenomena with which the sociology of mass media in the United States has to deal could not be separated as such from mechanisms of standardization, of transformation of art pieces into consumer goods, of calculated pseudo-individualization, and similar manifestations of what we call in German philosophical language, reification, end of quote. The epistemological problem between Adorno and Lars Asfeld was that Adorno could not translate these critical philosophical assumptions into research terms of the kind of Lars Asfeld's thinking. As Adorno said, such a translation would have been equal to the square of the circle. It is therefore not surprising that the Rockefeller Foundation, who financed the radio project, voted against Adorno's continued employment. At this point, we observe a transformation of Adorno's intellectual habitus his bad experiences with empirical social research in America resulted in the consciousness that this kind of technically advanced research could not be combined with his philosophical thinking, at least not completely. The consequence of this transformation was, the gap, was that the gap between Adorno's critical theoretical works and the empirical research project, projects in which he had to participate became wider. Even though Adorno engaged in the empirical research project of the authoritarian personality, a far-reaching investigation of authoritarian and anti-Semitic attitudes among Americans, published by Adorno and social researchers and psychologists Daniel J. Levinson, Elsa Franco Brunswick and Nevit R. Sanford of the University of California, Berkeley, he was mainly interested in completing his book Minima Moralia, and the dialectics of enlightenment, which he wrote together with Horkheimer. That both books, Minima Moralia was published in 1951, the first edition of the dialectics of enlightenment was completed in 1944 and published in 1947, were written in German is evidence for the big gap between American style of social empirical research and critical philosophical German thinking. I further argue that not only Adorno's critical attitude towards quantitative social research was the main factor for this development, but Auschwitz, which symbolized for Adorno as well as for Horkheimer the crystallization of the wrong development of modern society. In the Dialectics of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno argued that the Enlightenment unleashed both the emancipation and the self-destruction of the bourgeoisie. The self-destruction of bourgeois liberalism occurred through its perversion in totalitarianism, a development that Horkheimer and Adorno observed in Europe, Soviet Russia, and in the United States. 
They concluded that fascism was inherently connected with modernity, which meant that every modern society had the potential to become fascist. For Hochheimer and Adorno, fascist thinking and anti-Semitic attitudes were not characteristics of a certain nation, such as Germany, but were the result of a psychological pathology stemming from the faulty development of modern society. The book was informed by a dialectical, psychological, and eventually anthropologically based philosophy of history because of Horkheimer and Adorno considered the faulty development of modern society originating in antiquity or in primeval times and conceived this process to be universal. Following this perspective, Ulysses, the Marquis de Sade, American consumption industry, totalitarian fascism and totalitarian communism appeared as the equal results of the fall of modern man. Although Horkheimer and Adorno thought that the Jews were replaceable in their role as victims of fascism, anti-Semitism became for them the central metaphor of modern civilization. In Minima Moralia, Adorno articulated what could be done against this criminal development. The only person that could resist totalitarianism was the autonomous, critical thinking and non-conformist individual whose existence was for Adorno not possible in the ruling political systems of liberalism, socialism and fascism, a statement he formulated as such, there is no right life in the wrong one. However, this statement should not be taken as proof of Adorno's deep determin de deterministic pessimism, although one could not lead a right life in the contemporary wrong society, one could at least try to make society better, and therefore to lead a more right life in a wrong society. Considering the task Adorno attributed to philosophy, we see again Adorno's habitus of a Weimar intellectual radical for him dialectical critical philosophy was detached from capitalism and served as weapon against instrumental science and scholarship. This instrumental science, by which Adorno primarily meant not the natural sciences, rooted according to him in man's original sin, the violation of nature in order to exploit it, which Adorno considered as point of origin of capitalism and, therefore, of totalitarianism and of Auschwitz. Seen from this perspective from, of modern mass and consumer culture, as well as instrumentalization and technization of thinking appeared as progressive and barbarous at the same time, a general phenomenon that could be observed in liberalism, social, socialism and fascism. The only remedy was for Adorno a barbaric austerity in order to restore the non-barbaric. With the consciousness that Auschwitz could recur, that one had to dedicate all his intellectual power to prevent that it happened again, that Auschwitz was not only a German problem, but the condensation of the inner contradictories of modern society in general, and, last but not least, that Adorno, with his intellectual German philosophical habitus, could finally write and speak again in that language he considered to be congeneric to speculative philosophy, Adorno returned to Frankfurt in 1949. Hochhammer had prepared the return of the last remaining three members of the Institute of Social Research, himself, Adorno, and Frederick Pollock, during two visit visiting trips to Frankfurt and West Germany in 1948. In Frankfurt, Adorno, now second director of the Institute, had to supervise empirical social research projects once again. It was clear to Horkheimer, Pollock and Adorno that such projects would legitimize the relevance of the Institute of Social Research in West Germany, providing empirical knowledge that could be applied by politicians and industrialists. Although Adorno was still highly critical about the practice of social research and its, and its results, he believed in the possibility that critical philosophy could guide empirical social research. But in the late 1950s, Adorno distanced himself more and more from empirical social research and turned again to critical dialectical philosophy. This was the prim primary reason for employing Ludwig von Friedeburg, who came to the Institute in 1954, uh, and the statistician Rudolf Gunzert, who came in 1957, first as department head of empirical research, and in 1959 as second director of the Institute. 
Adorno's distancing from empirical social research had something to do with the experiences as supervisor of these social research projects. Adorno became more and more aware of the fact that empirical social research funded by industrialists, philanthropic organizations, or the German government was heteronomous because the clients had too much to say about what, they, what happened with the research results. A striking example is the so-called Betriebsklimastudie. It's a study of work atmosphere conducted in 1954-55 and commissioned by the Mannesmann Holding, a steel and coal producer. Adorno and his staff had to investigate the attitudes of the workers and of the managers towards the Mannesmann Holding. The task was, was, according to Adorno, I quote, to generate information about effective social work and to uncover the nerve points being responsible for tensions between members of the staff and between the staff and the management, end of quote. The institute planned to interview about 1,000 workers and to lead 500 to 600 group discussions. The investigation brought the conclusion that the majority of the workers did not have any interest in labor union politics, which Adorno and his co-workers interpreted as a result of the alienation of the workers from their workplace. Adorno wanted to publish these research results, but the management of the Mannesmann holding prevented the complete publication because they feared bad press. In addition, they argued that the methods applied by the Institute were dubious and biased, and would not represent the general opinion of the workers. Director Karl Harzig even suspected Adorno of maintaining certain political uh, social tendencies. In the end, the Institute published a short book that included the quantitative analysis and the questionnaire, but not the qualitative critical interpretation of the data. Adorno felt vindicated about his opinion that empirical social research did nothing more than approve the status quo that the capitalist totalitarian development was that far advanced that it corrupted research techniques and that against these tendencies only critical philosophy would help. Noah Stroud is right in characterizing the members of Weimar Republic's intellectual field as lions debating each other and struggling for the primacy of their philosophies. But he is wrong in interpreting the intellectual culture of the Federal Republic of Germany, the FRG, as characterized by Lamps, as the peaceful and pro-democratic consequence of Weimar's debate culture and of the suppression of intellectuality during the Nazi regime. I quote, by the 1960s, the vocabulary, partnership, cooperation and order dominated discourse in the Federal Republic, whereas struggle, crisis and chaos have been keywords for much of the preceding half century. End of quote. On the surface, Stroud's thesis appears to be true. The intellectuals of the early FRT usually cooperated in order to build and establish a democratic society, and anti-Semitic and fascist statements were not articulated in public anymore. However, I argue that beneath the surface, those conflicts and debates still existed in the FRG that had begun in Weimar Republic, and that this fact is evidence for the assumption that these Weimar conflicts also characterized the intellectual culture of the early FRG. I further argue that complexity and contradictoriness were the main elements of the intellectual culture of post-war Germany, and that these characteristics were condensed in Adorno's habitus. I want to illustrate the specific Weimar habitus in the FRG by considering Adorno's relationship with three intellectuals, namely Heidegger, Arnold Gehlen, and René König. Already in the late 1920s and early 1930s, Adorno had chosen Heidegger as his prim primary enemy. In Adorno's opinion, Heidegger not only maintained a wrong consciousness because he tried to overcome idealism and instead repeated what he criticized, but Heidegger also developed a philosophy that included folkish and anti-Semitic elements and that legitimized the Nazi takeover of power in Germany. In the late 1950s, Adorno turned again to Heidegger and formulated a profound critique of the German philosopher's existential ontology. In fact, Adorno dedicated the whole book to Heidegger, the jargon of authenticity, 
published in 1964, and many parts of his negative dialectics from 1966 are a critique of Heidegger's philosophy. Adorno shared Horkheimer's opinion about Heidegger's philosophy as being a sort of philosophical ideology that was in league with German fascism and that was still very prominent in the German academic field in the late 1950s and early 60s. The reason why Adorno's relationship to Heidegger was complex is that even though he identified Heidegger as main intellectual enemy, Adorno respected him as being on eye level with himself. Taking a look at Heidegger's critique of technology, we also see that this critique was not so different from Adorno's critical opinion about technology. Both were representatives of German Geisteswissenschaften, advocating hermeneutics and being highly skeptical about research techniques of the natural sciences. Thus, Heidegger and Adorno had similar viewpoints and similar radical foundations of their philosophies, yet they stood at the opposite ends of the Weimar kaleidoscope. Next. <coughs> Even more contradictory was Adorno's relationship with philosophical anthropologist Arnold Galen. It was well known in the 50s and 60s that Galen, who continued his career as sociologist immediately after 1945, had not only cooperated with Nazi organizations, but that his philosophical anthropology contained fascist elements. On the one hand, Adorno tried to prevent Galen from getting powerful positions in the West German intellectual field. With this aim in mind, Adorno cooperated with other returned emigre scholars, for example, at the occasion of keeping Galen from accumulating power in the German Sociological Association. Helmut Plessner, another returned emigre, considered Galen to be a structural SS type. Adorno and Horkheimer also hindered the employment of Galen as professor at the University of Heidelberg in 1958. On the other hand, Adorno and Galen were on good terms with each other and cooperated in their intellectual endeavor to oppose mass and consumer culture. Further points of intellectual convergence were their critique of enlightenment and industrial society and their high estimation of Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy. In several radio broadcasts and a TV show in 1965, Adorno and Galen debated the role of the public in society and discussed topics such as freedom and institution. These debates were anything but spontaneous. Adorno and Galen coordinated their control controversies. Adorno's relationship with Galen did not remain undebated. Günther Anders, like Adorno and Emmy Gris, who lived in Vienna since 1950, sent Adorno a letter in August, in August 1963 asking how Adorno could have made a Burgfrieden, a party truce, with erstwhile Nazis like Galen. Adorno replied that Galen's case was ambiguous and that he did not intend to defame Galen because of his role in the Nazi regime. I quote, It is quite indifferent to me with whom I shake hands as long as nothing of this remains sticking to the paper upon which I have right, end of quote. Finally, I would like to discuss Adorno's relationship with René König. The leftist König emigrated in 1938 to Switzerland and passed his habilitation in Zurich. In 1949, he came back to West Germany and was awarded a professorship for sociology at the University of Cologne. On the one hand, Adorno cooperated with König in order to prevent ex-Nazis such as Galen from, att from attaining powerful positions in the German Sociological Association. On the other hand, he differed profoundly from König's epistemological foundations of sociology because König was an empiricist who strongly advocated American methods of quantitative social research and social psychology. Since Koenig's critique of critical theory as being totalitarian, which he formulated at the occasion of the 1959 Conference of German Sociologists in Berlin, the relationship between him and Adorno became more problematic. In 1961, Koenig even wrote a letter to Adorno in which he claimed that Adorno's culture critique would converge more and more with the group around Galen, which was exactly the group of German sociologists who had cooperated with the Nazi regime and continued their careers in the FRG. Koenig saw the situation as fatal result of a certain constellation which, which is still rooted in the 1920s. 
as we have seen throughout this lecture, Kirby was not completely wrong with this statement. I come to the conclusion. What was the essence that made Weimar intellectual culture radical? I think it was the uncompromising search of so many German intellectuals after 1918 for new epistemological grounds in a world that, as they experienced it, had come to an end. What they developed was as diverse and radical as it was antagonistic towards other such philosophical and sociological approaches. While the members of the Vienna Circle of Logical Empiricists developed a radical and analytical scientific language with which one could draw a sharp line between the, the own scientific worldview and the mythical ideas of pseudo-scientists, Adorno developed a radical Marxist, Freudian and Hegelian negative dialectics which intended nothing less than fundamentally criticize what went wrong in the development of modern society. According to Adorno, either society may be achieved a reconciliation between subject and object through reflection of the moment when man started to violate nature, or, and this seemed much more plausible to him, modern society would continue its existence in contradictions and antagonisms. These radical approaches were irreconcilable. For Adorno, for example, the logical empiricists were positivists, and positivism had in his mind become an accomplice of totalitarian ideology. This uncompromising attitude could not be practiced coherently. The contradictions of modern society did not allow such an uncompromising, coherent lifestyle. Instead, intellectuals such as Adorno were torn up in their scholarly attitude and their social relationships and economic and political pressures in everyday life. This might be the explanation of why Adorno could oppose Galen politically, but stood at the same time on good terms with him considering his critique of modern mass society. It might be this fragmentized character of Weimar Republic's radical intellectual culture that allowed Adorno to withstand the contradictions and catastrophes of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Uh, so why Auschwitz? In your lecture there are um, several points in, uh, in the trajectory of uh, Adorno. For example, a uh, case of Lazarus mm -hmm. It seems very important, as, as we all know. Uh, there are a lot of uh, immigrants uh, from Germany and Austria as well. Uh, for example, Leo Strauss, Karl Mannheim, who tried to be accepted, to be co-optated uh, mm -hmm. in an American style of thinking. And uh, and system, of course, uh, but we talk about thinking. Mm -hmm. And your case of Lazarus Feld, I think I should add that Lazarus Feld wasn't theorists. There was Parsons, who was theorist, uh, and uh, his theory, structural functionalism, uh, was a good foundation for quantitative uh, empirical researchers. So. Did you study the connection uh, Adorno on Parsons or Marathon, for example? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I know the case of Mannheim, they, not, not on Parsons, uh, did a lot uh, to not uh, Mannheim, to not to accept Hart Mannheim and uh, make uh, sociological knowledge a middle range theory in, uh, in, their, in their theory. Mm -hmm. So. Maybe this case was crucial in uh, changing Adorno again to the mm -hmm. to be critical, to be um, critical. Mm -hmm. And the next uh, case is uh, this story about uh, climate changing. This seems very important mm -hmm. for for changing his mind. So. I, I, I don't see Auschwitz so important. You, maybe you didn't show it for, to me, maybe you can explain mo more, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or in other cases. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, first, um, the relationship between Adorno and Parsons. Parsons um, 
Well, you see that in the writings of Adorno in the in the 50s and and 60s, Parsons is main enemy. Mm -hmm. This is the main enemy who harmonizes in a totalitarian way um, all social 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 theory in a way. And harmonizing is for Adorno totalitarian because he likes the antagonisms between the phenomena and the, the materials. So mm -hmm. Parsons is a main target. Um, even even more in the 60s, I think, even more than Durkheim and others are sociologists. Well, you know, Las Asperger's, he considered them to be his social researcher, empiricist. Mm -hmm. It's not on eye level, but Parsons is dangerous for Adorno. That's a, that's a, it's a main, he's a main enemy beside Heidegger, Parsons and Heidegger. Was it in the 30s? So, any connections, any meetings? I, d I didn't any? find anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't find anything. I think um, they, um, the Horkheimer circle, let's, let's call it like that, it's not the Frankfurt School, of course, it's from, coming from the 60s, and um, they did not have good relationships to the Harvard uh, uh, circle. They had good relationships with, uh, with Columbia University, also to Ohio, Chicago, Chicago of course, yes, very important Chicago, um, also to Berkeley, of course, yes, to California, but not to Harvard, others did. Other immigrants. And that's an interesting point, I think. It's a, that could be, could be uh, investigated more profoundly, I think. Um, why Auschwitz? It's true, you're right. I did not make the case so strong in, a, in a, a, a my lecture because Adorno talks about Auschwitz or writes about Auschwitz as Horkheimer does um, in a very metaphysical way. Mm. It's like a, 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 the unspeakable. And it's behind everything what Adorno writes in the 50s and 60s. Then. So uh, that's why I, I think Auschwitz is something like a metaphysical core element of, of his, of his well, legitimization of his profound critique of, of modern society and modern research techniques and modern, modern science, of course. That's true. But you find them. Um, at the end of the 50s, Adorno gave his talk, what means uh, 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 coming to terms with the past? What means education after Auschwitz? These, but this is a, this is a phenomenon, but these two papers and these two lectures he gave at the end of the, of the 50s and early 60s. And then it turned again to be more, uh, he turned again to be more politically engaged in, 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 the, in the Germany's coming uh, terms with the past which was, of course, excluded in the 1950s and suppressed. So, um, yes, you're right. I think that was pretty good point. So. And about, yeah, for example, for in case of habitus and Bourdieu sociology, the case of climate changing and this uh, struggle, uh, not publishing or other things, would be the best example yes. for habitus theory. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Middle, lower class and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. bourgeoisie, so... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have maybe two, two questions. And uh, um, uh, uh, what happens with uh, uh, relationship, maybe not only personal, but especially intellectual relationship between uh, Adorno and Horkheimer in uh, during the fifties, when Horkheimer uh, also came back, uh, became rector of. Uh, uh, Wolfgang Goethe University uh, and so on and uh, um, sometimes for, 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 for students with some simplification uh, it's possible to speak about the decline of uh, Horkheimer intellectual activity, productivity uh, in compare with previous early critical theory of yes. late 30 and, and so on and uh, um, uh, uh, what uh, was their intellectual relationship uh, in uh, this uh, late period of Horkheimer activity, and the second question is about um, American period of Adorno activity, uh, uh, his relationship with uh, a circle of New School of Social Research, because uh, I know about the hostility of Hannah and so on, but I suppose not only Arendt would be a person in New School. And uh, for example, now, uh, maybe in the turn of the century, uh, Arendt and the New School Circle uh, have more attention uh, than even Adorno, especially in English speaking. Mm -hmm. Both in their Strauss, 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 Strauss,
it is true that uh, the intellectual productivity in Horkheimer is uh, declined in the 50s. Mm -hmm. This has a reason. Uh, Horkheimer uh, acts um, 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 in the public. Mm -hmm. As rector of the University of Frankfurt, um, which was a highly prestigious uh, uh, position, in the world, but also he, he gives many, many lectures for, in public, mm -hmm. in the, at the university, but also you know, Christian Jewish uh, organizations mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. for educational purposes in American households mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Ockham is very, very uh, active in that position, and he's still the first director of the institute, mm -hmm. and he is he is the he's the man. We can have said he's a sort of a manager who has uh, is on very good terms with very very powerful persons in the early FRG, with Theodor Hoes, with politicians, with also with Conrad Adenauer. He's very good in making contacts and networking, and that's I think that's the main activity of Horkheimer in the fifties. And Adorno, well, he's not. Uh, uh, is not gifted in doing these things. So it's a, and this is, I think, uh, um, it, is, it is a clear, it's a clear uh, um, um, between the relationship between Hork and Adorno. It's very clear what what everyone has to do. Frederick Pollock is the one who organizes the economic insights of the institute and uh, you know, the whole the whole uh, activities there. Borkham is the one who makes the connection and who represents the Institute of Social Research. And he's a very and also a very powerful person connecting West Germany with America, also with the Chica University of Chicago, of course, because they have an exchange uh, um, service and then um, a program. Mm -hmm. And Adorno is the one who intellectually leads the institute in the 50s, mm -hmm. but dependent also intellectually on Borkham. Adorno does nothing, I mean, also the intellectual, on the, on the level of ideas and research practice, he does nothing without uh, Horkheimer's permission. Mm -hmm. It's a strong interdependent um, uh, mm -hmm. relationship, and um, he is still very much dependent on Horkheimer's will. Mm -hmm. um, this changes around 19. 60, when Adorno became first uh, director of the Institute of Social Research, then it is observable, you can observe that there is another, another, another Marxist term mm -hmm. leading to negative dialectics mm -hmm. and the struggle mm -hmm. of authenticity. And then Horkheim, on the other hand, he retires and uh, becomes very much religious. He is, again, let's say, uh, he, he turns to be a very religious scholar. Uh, uh, connecting Schopenhauer with, with, uh, with Jewish Jewish traditions in a way. It's an interesting development. Mm -hmm. way. And um, yes, in exile, uh, the New School of Social Research, these were the main enemies of Horkheimer and Adorno, um, the emigrees there. Although uh, Horkheimer writes in 1937, he publishes his, his article, a very credible article, The Jews in Europe. Uh, he, later he says, he, he, he said this was his main faux pas. Mm -hmm. It's a radical critique of uh, uh, Jewish liberals, and I think he means the people in the new school of social research. Uh, uh, because those people do not reflect that liberalism actually is the, is, is the basis for the development of mm -hmm. modern society into totalitarianism. So that is Horkheim's Marxist uh, thinking at this time. And I think he's criticizing New School of Social Research. Mm -hmm. and usually, they also work on. They continue their their debating culture in a way, conflict culture in the United States. Uh, with many people, they were not on good terms with. So people from the New School of Social Research, but also with with other inquiries like Kurt, Kurt Levin, psychologist, main enemy. Mm -hmm. That's uh, also with. Uh, um, uh, uh, with other uh, um, uh, 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 psychologists, who, who I forgot, uh, I lost his, which one? Uh, no, the psychologist uh, uh, working at the Institute of Social Research, you know, from, uh, uh, from, of course, yes. Uh, um, but this was also, he had become a main enemy because he adapted to the American style of social research and psychological research. So I think this is a, it's a very conflict and problematic relationship.
So I actually have okay. Yes, yes. 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 Well, actually, first of all, I'm, I'm afraid my question will be too ingenious because my occupation is not a donor himself and not a Frankfurt School, but Walter mm -hmm. Benjamin and Ernst Bloch, who are a bit, a bit separated, I suppose, or from the main uh, stream of uh, these uh, sociological orientated uh, studies uh, and from the whole this theoretical concept. But simultaneously, this is the very reason I wonder now. Uh, well, uh, uh, when uh, you uh, when you have used this problem of habitus and uh, this uh, generation of women intellectual, I actually wonder uh, is it uh, really uh, correct and uh, correct without any discrepancy uh, because of this fact of uh, Benjamin and Bloch and first of all uh, because of their topic of the topic. Because first of all, uh, I uh, I'm recollecting uh, during your speech the discussion between Adorno and Bloch according to Utopia and uh, uh, Utopia and Logic, uh, logic. and uh, so uh, that's why I wonder um, uh, was this uh, despairing philosophy was this uh, was this feeling of uh, uh, the decision. Uh, modernity and enlightenment in crisis, uh, such common for the for the generation and for these chemicals. Because first of all of this uh, utopian topic and because uh, this mm -hmm. uh, obvious uh, discordance uh, among these philosophers according to according, uh, according to this topic. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you think that this this, that this is the main element of this of this habitus in, in the in my republic of the, the utopian uh, discussion of your uh, topic. Well, I see. Uh, I can see some kind of discrepancy because mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when we uh, if we if we are considering them as um, as some kind of entity, uh, so this entity is uh, is uh, a bit interrupted with the discrepancy, and so this uh, problem of utopia and loading, which is actually not so not so tragic. Not so, not so, uh, which which uh, has its radicality, uh, not in uh, not in uh, tragical attitude, but mm -hmm. in uh, in some connotations of hope, uh, a principle of hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see that as a very this topic was uh, has uh, has been frequently a reason for the conflict between intellectuals, for example, between Benjamin and. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, 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 absolutely. I would not, I would not say that this. Well, you know, I, I try to 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 describe my habitus. Um, I think it's. I think discrepancies be, um, are part of the habitus. I would not. I would not say that. Um, I would not. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, try to 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 to, um, to harmonize the habitus in a way. But I think this is a, is a very but the fact that well, the thing is, what 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 uh, the main element for the habitus is that these scholars debated among each other, and that this a, a strong discrepancy between Adorno and Benjamin, of course, and Adorno and Bloch. Well, between Bloch and Adorno, this is a very conflictual situation, and the relationship they well, uh, Adorno hated Bloch. <laughs> yes, yes, but Benjamin, not Benjamin, he respected a lot, even though he criticized him, even when he knew that Benjamin had. Biggest problems in, 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 in Germany and in Europe. I mean, as a you know, he was threatened, you know, the, the, the threatened, and the donors did criticize him and did not allow that Benjamin uh, could publish in the in the in the in the journal of the Institute of Social Research as such. Yet be censored by Adorno and Horkheimer. Yes. Right. So yes, of course. I think I think you're right. Uh, it's part of the habitus of this Weimar habitus. That it is very conflictuous. That it is, you know, that it is, uh, it's not a harmony in a way. So, but still, this is, uh, I think this uh, this harmony is not also according to their destinies, but uh, also I think also according to this topic of utopia, mm -hmm. because I suppose this topic was really, really familiar to to the uh, multiplicity of their texts, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I I believe that uh, this is this is really an, an, an 
great uh, great example for for comparison between between them and for really for for the measurement of this uh, mm -hmm. great of 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 trend of um, of strategy of 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 uh, feeling of depression of modernity. Yes, 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 of course, yes. Mm -hmm. it be, it be also, uh, some 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 personal. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I, I thank you, Dasi. Yes. Okay, I got maybe a little question. Uh, can we uh, can we find any roots of uh, Adonis uh, theory of music in the Weber radicalism? Of course, besides his practice of, uh, as a musician, mm -hmm. maybe this practice can be can be interpreted as a part of a special radical habitus we're talking about. I, I, don't know. Mm -hmm. I would say so. Yes, yes, I would say uh, because of the dissonances, the disharmonies. Yeah, this is very, very. Uh, for him, it's very important. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing because musicology, his, his writings about music philosophy and, and, and social theory are, you know, one in a way. Also, I mean, the the the, 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 the well, the hate against uh, against uh, of Parsons of his harmonization. And it's the same thing with with music. It's a disharmony in a way. That that's what I don't really want to to say and to claim that disharmony is the producing is the fruitful mechanism of, uh, and we should not harmonize uh, things in a way. Yeah. I think so. Yes. It is, as a footnote, the, the music you heard at the very beginning, so for the first 20 minutes, was Adorno, uh, his, <laughs> yes. his string quartet from 1921, mm -hmm. with a lot of this harmonies. Okay. Uh, methodological question, what do you mean by Weimar uh, habitus? Is it a term or is it a me metaphor? Uh, the, does it have any genealogy? Uh, does it have any history? What's the roots of this final? Is it a term? I, maybe I, I don't know? Mm, well, that's what I tried to do in the lecture. I mean, it's a, um, what I try to describe is a certain habitus or a certain condition um, of intellectuals, of younger intellectuals in my years, after 1918. So mm -hmm. they see the First World War as a, as a main, main fact, factor. So it's based on the First World War? Yes, I think so. Uh -huh. I think so too. It's, uh, it's, so that's, uh, that's the experience of the, the old world of the 19th century coming to an end, and then something new had to be you know, produced and generated. And the conflict is the main feature of the of this habitus? Uh, appeared uh, extremely after the World War. Yes, I think so. Uh -huh. Even more than before, first of all. Uh -huh. Because um, you have, well, after after 1918, the Kaiserreich was over. You know, you had the Weimar Republic, you had communists, you had fascists, yeah. you had liberals, and you had, you know, Jewish Zionists, and you have anti-Zionists, and, you know, this is a, it's a very lively but very conflictuous uh, field, I would say. Well, I have an example of, uh, of uh, finishing any con uh, conflict. For example, uh, psychology, um, the conflict with psychologists in the philosophical department before World War mm -hmm. stopped after the World War. The book of Martin Kush. Mm -hmm. uh, the conflict stopped, uh, for example. Mm, yes, that's true. Mm. But the conflict between psychology and other uh, sociology, for example. Oh. Maybe. I mean, inner, of course, I mean, inner, inner uh, 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 disciplinary uh, debates okay. and conflict may be, of course, yes, mm -hmm. sent or stopped, um, but, you know, between the specific and several disciplines. I mean, it was uh, spread over the, any intellectuals, over all intellectuals in the Republic. I would say so, uh -huh. I would say so. Okay. I would say so, of course, I mean, this is, I didn't say that in the in the lecture, but um, I think this is um, this characterizes the main cities in Germany, Frankfurt, Berlin, for example. You see that partly also in Cologne, which is a very lively university, and uh, in the main intellectual centers, not in the provinces so much. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a it's a city, it's a city, okay. urban urban phenomenon, I think. But yes, of course, I have to investigate more. Right. <laughs> it's, very, it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm.
Would you actually say that this generation is really an age cohort or a generation uh, defined rather by the experience of the world wars, not a you know, kind of double-meaning generation? I think so first world war is, is, is so it's not so much well yes of course not the oldest processes and the old mandarins mm. are part of this debating culture I think. So it's more I think it's the Borgies generation, those who are born in the late nineteenth century and the uh, uh, the, the front generation, those who are born in the late nineteenth century, and the Borgies generation between nineteen hundred and nineteen twelve, let's say. These are these are the, the main, you know, uh, Generation members mm. of who is why my intellectual yeah, era. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you, um, as specialist uh, uh, engaged in this field, uh, uh, is it some uh, archival term uh, in Frankfurt School Studies? Because uh, uh, after First way of Martin J and uh, yes. maybe Vickers House. Uh, we have uh, uh, 20 or uh, maybe 30 years of uh, uh, access to uh, archive, correspondence, uh, uh, drafts, and so on. Uh, in, for example, in Heidegger or in Husserl studies, we have some kind of archival revolution because of Beitrage Reignis, because of uh, Husserliana new volumes, and um, if we can uh, some something essentially use with Frankfurt School uh, when we can open to archive to collected volumes of Marcuse, Adorno, Horkheimer, yes. and so on, or, or not? Because my impression is that uh, uh, in the, during the 20th century uh, uh, we have not uh, any essential new uh, in this uh, industry, uh, for example, uh, with Benjamin, yes, but not with the core of uh, Frankfurt School. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's my impression, but maybe you know better. So, you, you mean there's nothing new that can Yes, be yes. Yes, um, well, not, I think the, um, the manuscripts that are on the road and Horkheimer, um, uh, for example, these are all published. This is gone, in a way. And, uh, this is, there is no archival interest in that and that, that's coming something new. What is new, um, also in my book I hope, which will be uh, somehow, sometime appear in, in the future, um, um, what is new is the, um, the practice of social research um, Adorno supervised and, and Adorno participated in. So this, this, you know, not only in America and in the authoritarian personality, but also in the, in the so-called so group experiment in 1950-1951, this was the first and major social research project in, uh, in, the, in young FRG. And this is uh, not well um, edited. There is, there is new material. That's interesting. So I think this, this on the practice level, Mm -hmm. There is new material um, mm -hmm. that that could lead to another, you know, that could bring or lead to another image um, mm -hmm. of, of this Institute of Social Research mm -hmm. and its position. Well, mm -hmm. well, I think you know the reception of, of the, the Frank, so-called Frankfurt School is highly problematic because if you if you then look at the archival material and at the correspondences, mm -hmm. well, these are all not all of these were completely published. Mm -hmm. You know, the the, uh, the personal papers of Hockham's are. It's, it's far bigger than, than that book is now published. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the, the editors did not consider those those correspondence partners as to be interesting, you mm -hmm. know, because nobody knows them. Mm -hmm. So, but these are interesting characters because then you see the whole network of Hawkeye and of these sort of these people, and this is also very contradictory mm -hmm. because then you know, this were not only leftists, of course, mm -hmm. they were conservatives, also ex-Nazis, mm -hmm. and those people, you know, it's, a, it's, it's I think this is a, it's a, if you would, if you would uh, edit these materials, mm -hmm. I think you would have a different image of the Frankfurt School and of its position in Weimar, uh, in Weimar Republic, in exile, in American mm -hmm. exile, and also in young FRG. Mm -hmm. And this would, I think, um, it would not please Mm -hmm. <coughs> scholars of the Frankfurt School now, I have to say. So, mm -hmm. 
but this is an edition project. This would, I mean, I, I'm, now I'm involved in another edition project mm -hmm. as a cooperation project between Goethe University and the Institute of Social Research. We try to publish those manuscripts from those empirical social research projects which have never been the, uh, seen the light of the day. So and this is a, they were not published because, um, um, you know, the work of the law and uh, said it's nothing worse or whatever, um, and, but this is very interesting. It's interesting stuff, what, uh, what could be, you know, what I think it could, could uh, create another image of the matter. It's uh, federal and public uh, federal. field, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But nothing from the 20s, I think. There is nothing. I didn't, well, I, I searched, I researched the whole archive of the Institute of uh, Social Research, and I think it's from the 20s. There is nothing more interesting, I think, mm -hmm. to, 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 be, to be edited in a way. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to ask you about the media strategy slash publication strategy of. Wait, mostly I don't know, because you said something uh, a little earlier about, uh, about uh, Horkheimer, and I was wondering if you can say more about Adorno and uh, exactly located into the question of you know, the, the Weimar, the first and second, you know, before and after the, the World War, whether it changes or whether it remains in the same, uh, in the same habitat. You mean the publication strategies? They, uh, the publication strategies and at the same time the public engagement strategies. So actually it would be two questions. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, yes. I think the public engagement strategies changed a lot during uh, 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 the exile years in America because um, the Institute lost a lot of money in the end of the 30s because of the big crash. They, you know, they lost a lot of money, so they had to, uh, you know, uh, uh, generate and mobilize new, new money, you know, new financial resources from other institutions, and those institutions who were willing to pay for empirical social research projects were the American Jewish Committee and the Jewish Labor Committee, and these re re required that Horkheimer and Adorno and also Pollock had to engage in public. Mm -hmm. This is a public endeavor, it's about democratic about democratization, it's about uh, education, it's about um, um, you know enlightening American people that also fascist tendencies were at work in America. And and you know, Aufklärung. Mm -hmm. This is very mm -hmm. important. And they, they continue these practices, you know, this public engagement in the fifties. In particular Horkheimer. Yes, mm -hmm. he's a very, you know, he's a person, you know, uh, an intellectual who, can, who could represent the whole Institute of Social Research and mobilize new money, of course, from the German government and uh, other organizations, industrialists. So, uh, yes, I think there is a big change. And um, but it's not because of internal conviction, but because, because of external. External, uh, external. Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah, external. They, they, were, they were very elitist in a way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Hork and Madonna would have done that if they had uh, enough money. And you know, so. And um, uh, the publication strategies, I mean, it's hard to say because uh, Adorno tries or publishes some articles on English, in English, mm -hmm. uh, and Hork uh, um, publishes his book on uh, um, the Eclipse of Reason. Mm -hmm. These were the only English books, and um, they continued the, 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 the uh, journal of uh, social research, which then, I think, around 40, they changed the German title into an English one. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the, 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 the journal was, you know, they didn't have enough money to, to publish it, uh, to continue to publish the publishment of this, of this journal. And then in the 50s, after coming back to Germany, they found, and this is very, very important for them, they found, uh, after all, Adorno, they found Surkamp, uh, Peter Surkamp, who was an invert also, um, who was suppressed and, 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 and uh, was a victim of the Nazi regime, and who was very engaged in creating some sort of a, you know, democratic intellectual public in the early uh, Federal Republic of Germany. And Adorno, of course, was part of this. Besides, you know, many others, of course, also Ronnie König and uh, maybe not Hilde, of course, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, but 
about the DX and other intellectuals, um, which are nicht. And uh, uh, I think Surkamp, Surkamp in Imperium, as they called it later, and was very, very important to create this, this thought. What Habermas later describes as you know, a public discourse of, 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 uh, of democratic uh, interaction. I would say that, you know, exactly, in this short because we are slowly running out of energy. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe uh, one of our questions. Uh, uh, as for me, maybe, uh, is the dialectic uh, of, of Kluhung uh, uh, was essential for uh, Institute of Social Research in Federal Republic? Because um, it seems uh, for me that uh, before edition, yeah, after Amsterdam first uh, yes. very limited printed, yes. I suppose uh, both Horkheimer and Adorno, uh, by several reasons, uh, not give this book in front of his uh, school. And only after edition and this wave of uh, uh, radicalism of uh, new generation, this book was not the label and the symbol of uh, critical theory, especially in, in, in that period. Yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's, a, it's an interesting story that, uh, and that's maybe how Auschwitz comes back into, into, the, uh, uh, to the, into the paper and into mm -hmm. the argument, because Dialectics of Enlightenment, in a way, is, is you know it's, it's written in, in exactly the period that the Nazis merged into Jews, in a way, and this was also known in America. And maybe it has to do with this. I mean, it's a very dark book in a way. It's a, it's a very idiosyncratic book, and its method. I mean, its methods are you know it's uh, it's hard to to not to understand, but hard to estimate it as a as. Uh, it's a coherent, uh, I think it's uncoherent, it's fragmentarized, it's, it's mm -hmm. all over the top. Highly interesting, highly fascinating, but also highly problematic. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> coming back to Germany, um, Horkheimer prevented to, that this book is going to be republished. Mm -hmm. Not so much Adorno. Adorno wanted, was very proud of, of his intellectual endeavor, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he, uh, he wanted that this book got published in German in Germany in the 50s and 60s, um, but Horkham granted that mm. all the time and uh, um, did not want that this was so, 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 as, as, this could be seen as representative element or branch label of the Institute of Social Research. He did not, did not want that. Yeah. So he, I think when people say in research literature they fear that they were considered as Marxists. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, with the anti-Bolshevism also, mm -hmm. which also continued from Nazi Germany to the FRT, mm -hmm. and, um, and the beginning of the Cold War, maybe this uh, is, is a good reason, I don't know. Um, but I think uh, it was, for him, two contradictorious, mm -hmm. two contradictions of this book that could be republished. And he tried to, to, to you know, to sell the institute mm -hmm. in the democratic society as something that creates progressive knowledge, social knowledge, how society could be dem be democratized. Mm -hmm. So, too pessimistic. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's too pessimistic. I think so.